Kia ora, talofa, namaste, haere mai, and welcome to the Niche Cage Variety Show, where we deliver an Aotearoa sporting platter, touching on a bunch of Aotearoa sporting matters for the platter that tickle our fantasy. Prior to this, we have recorded a podcast for our Patreon Fano, which are quite cricket-centric at the moment. Got Will Young and Colin DeGrand home in county cricket. Lots of Black Caps thoughts as well. So big it up to the Patreon Fano who support us every month. And there's extra podcasts there every week, cricket-centric. Otherwise, Patreon's the best way to support the Niche Case. Straight up the guts, run it straight as well as all the other shit, reading the website, theniche-case.com. Sign up to the email banger as well via Substack, theniche-case.substack.com. All those links are in the bio, and it's the best way to support us. Just support the content. You can donate directly via Patreon. You can sign up to the email banger and enjoy extra Aotearoa sporting content. Probably mandatory Monday and Friday re reading, I'd say. Every evening, Monday and Friday, the email gets sent out and it's mandatory niche case reading, let alone anything else we do, podcast through the niche case podcast feed and writing about Aotearoa sport in depth, big yarns, theniche-case.com. We always start our podcast wildcard with a dose of mindfulness. What are you going to share with us this podcast? share a um, little bit of wisdom from Mr. Joseph Campbell, the, uh, the myth man himself, who said, we must let go of the life we've planned so as to have the life that is waiting for us. We're pretty good at planning, aren't we, us humans? Get a bit into that, uh, <laughs> you know, that right wing bird, bit of masculinity. We love to make a plan. We love to formulate, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then when this happens, I'm going to do that. And then that, maybe that's just all holding you back from what you're actually supposed to do, which is go with the flow and embrace everything that comes to you. Uh, yeah, what's that um, What's that saying about the, the best laid plans and um, going awry and, and all those things, you know? It's, it's one thing to set a plan. It's another thing entirely for that plan to actually come through and for everything to happen as you expect it to happen because there's just far too, there's far too many, like, moving parts in this, this machine, isn't there, where you just, like, you can't predict everything. Um, you can't, like, plan things absolutely and say this is exactly how everything is going to work out and that, like you're going to get some spanners in the works along the way and actually maybe trying to like um micromanage your own life to that extent actually isn't the most healthy way to go about it and and ultimately like i mean it, this is getting close to like one of those fate and free will type um type uh arm wrestle things but it it seems pretty clear that whether I don't know whether we're in control of our own destiny or not. There's there's certainly aspects that um, within that that we have no control over, and it is much better to like um, rather than hold. I get you know what else that it actually tells you as well from that quote is it also tells you about like sticking to ideas rather than realities, doesn't it? Because it's the the life that's there waiting for you. It's like it's there to it's there to have. Um, but if you're too focused on this thing that you think should be the case rather than what is the case you're kind of living in the in-between phase where you're going nowhere and you're just standing still and, and you're stuck and you're blinded by your own preconceptions that aren't actually based in reality because they're based in hopes and dreams, right? And that's also not a healthy place to be. I will say like, so for more spiritually inclined people who are all on like personal growth, spiritual growth and, and transformation and just whatever, trying to be a better person, you get into like manifestation, you get into like... Um, positive thoughts and positive intentions that can be quite self-restrictive because you're making plans so you need to find a balance between making those plans and envisioning what's going to happen what you would like to happen but releasing that because you've got no fucking clue what's going to happen and you've got no control over what is going to happen wild card let's crack into some aotearoa sport I don't know where Stephen Adams is. Haven't seen him for a while. He's lost in the Mangroves wildcard. I assume you might know where Stephen Adams is to start our show. Yeah, he's um he's at home in bed with a uh, 
the with a hot water bottle and a cup of warm soup. He's um in the in the health and safety protocols, which suggests he probably has COVID. He went into the protocols earlier on in the um, season, but I don't think that was. I think it was a non-COVID illness. So it sounds like potentially he's got the Rona. Um, last week I used my take to talk about why he should be back in the rotation to some extent. They're now in a new series against the Golden State Warriors. So basically I'm saying the exact same thing, um, but I'm translating it into a series against Golden State. Um, based on his illness, like that's the first thing. He missed the first game with the with the old Rona. He probably, uh, it seems unlikely, just listening to Taylor Jenkins talk, coach, that it seems extremely unlikely he'll be available for game two. Um, there is a little bit of a break because they travel back to California for game three, and, games three and four. So hopefully one of those ones will see him um, available. Because game one on Monday morning, I thought really spelled out the... Uh, their clear and obvious need for some Stephen Adams minutes in this series. Uh, first of all, Xavier Tillman continued to start in his absence, got 13 minutes, was a minus 26 net rating. Um, the team's offensive uh, just identity really struggled pretty badly while he was out there. They, those are 13 pretty easy minutes right there for Stephen Adams to just come swooping back in and take without having to lessen the role of uh, playoff hero Brandon Clark, who I think has just been outstanding for them, um, the backup center throughout the regular season. He's been great, so you don't necessarily need to take his minutes away to get Stephen Adams any minutes whatsoever. And they care. They did actually play quite well together as well. So when um, there is an opportunity for a few there when uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. is in foul trouble, as tends to happen. Uh, secondly, this did look a lot more like the Grizzlies team of the regular season. Like they, they seem to get back to what they do quite well in the, against the Warriors in that first game. Um, however, not to the full extent, because a lot of those things that define their offensive identity in particular, they actually lost, like they got beaten in those statistical categories. So second chance points, fast break points, points off turnovers, and especially points in the paint. Golden State Warriors actually had a, a slight advantage and um, more than a slight advantage in the points in the paint over the Grizzlies like these are the things that they were the best in the entire NBA at and they get been that here in a playoff series where you want to be at your best and I think probably a lot of that comes down to the fact they were also beaten in rebounds um beaten in rebounds by a smaller in terms of height uh Dubs team who didn't even have the ejected Draymond Green for the entire second half so obviously that cannot be like that cannot keep happening um those trends there if Memphis won a trip to the conference finals and you you can't just rely on the Warriors either to be like, well, they'll revert to the mean. They can't do that every game. Things will drop back. That's not going to happen because even if it does, the Grizzlies also can't rely on shooting 40% from deep because that's not who they are either. Um, well, who is the glue that sticks the Grizzlies rebounding? Their second chance opportunities, their screen assist for point paints and all that together? That would be Monsieur Steve. So, you know, Taylor Jenkins, bro. I, I, I know he listens to the podcast. I know he's a big fan. So, you know, get that man some ibuprofen and let's go for old... Uh, hopefully for game three. Maybe Stephen Adams get a bit of that uh, ivermectin. <laughs> yeah, well, if, if it works, it works. I mean, I'm not going to... But a bit of that bush... Me or, or alternatively, bush medicine would also go well. But a carver. But a carver. Kawa tea will do the trick. No, carver. Carver tea is wife, probably too relaxing. He needs it. Well, yeah. carver is quite relaxing as well. I would probably more so. <laughs> I just want Stephen Adams to be drinking carpet, to be honest. Radio I, Wildcard. I, I bet he has. My leading segment here, who is Dejan Arce? Popped up for the Warriors starting half, replacing Chanel Harris to Vida, who had a ruptured ball bag. Dejan Arce steps in and was low-key fantastic. Very solid in defense, similar to Harris to Vida. Very willing runner of the footy similar to Harris Tavita maybe a slightly more a bit more finesse with his kicking game than Harris Tavita I'd say but who is Dejan Asi from Christchurch young fella um, by the looks of it him and his whanau moved to Queensland um, where he went to school and played a lot of junior footy in southeast Queensland before I think he played first 15 rugby at one of the Brisbane schools as well before he was recruited by North Queensland Cowboys. He has been in that Cowboys system for at least four years, I think, since leaving high school. And so it was, it was kind of surprising that he was allowed to leave the Cowboys when he was recruited by the Cowboys. Not recruited out, to, out of Aotearoa, though. 
He was recruited by the Cowboys via first 15 rugby and junior footy in Queensland. And a lot of uh, good depth in that Cowboys setup. Like he's not going to be a starting half in that Cowboys team. And he probably wants to nail down one position. Whereas at the Cowboys, he played fullback for a game or two, played center for a few games, stepped into the halves, made his debut in the halves for the Cowboys and scored a try on debut against the Panthers, which was exceptional and a sign of some talent to come as well for Dejan Arce. Then he comes to the Warriors. All signs point to him being a hearty Aotearoa joker. Although in 2020, he was part of the Queensland under 20 origin squad. So that might be a bit tricky, but he does seem to be a hard, a hearty Kiwi as well. Maybe he was just exploiting a bit of origin uh, footy as well. So big up Dejan Arce, left the Cowboys for the Warriors, seeking opportunity. He's only got a contract for the season. So basically any footy that he does get, he's got to play the house down, command further opportunities as well. Don't think he's been part of any NZRL representative footy um, over my time covering rugby league. So curious to see what he does do. Could play for Samoa at the World Cup if he wanted to as well. Let's get statistical here, wildcard. Numbers, figures, divisions, streaks consecutive games points baggies what do you got uh potentially curses i mean we we always like uh you know we're not afraid to acknowledge a curse here on this podcast but and there has been this just weird trend of winless streaks through the flying kiwis realms and it only affects the fellas like none of the um none of the footy ferns players seem to have um found themselves in this kind of situation but a few of the guys have so i'll, I'll run through a couple of them quickly like joe bell's bromby um they were in a title race not that long ago like his first couple games he turned up they were winning them all they weren't conceding goals at all things looked good then their luck ran out and suddenly they've lost seven games in a row um they've had red cards in three of those games they've conceded five penalties in that time now they're unlikely to make the european spots at all Callum McCoward and Eli Just down a division in Denmark with uh, FC Helsingor. They were, at the time when the division split into the championship and relegation rounds, they were eight points clear in first. Um, since then, they've lost five games on the trot. They had previously only lost one game of their first 22. Um, they were conceding less than a goal per game in those first 22 games. Since then, they've leaked 13 goals in five games. They've dropped out of the, not only out of first place now, but out of the promotion spots entirely um, and have five games left to save this season. Still only two points off top, though, so they can turn things around. They can still salvage that. Um, Libby Kikache's Empoli. They went 17 games in a row without a win in Serie A before finally breaking that streak last week, um, which was Libby's eighth appearance and his first taste of victory in Italy. Um, it only took him, what, three months? Uh, coincidentally, the wins that bookended that streak, so the, the win before it started and the win that ended it, both against Napoli, who just happens to be Libby Kikachi's childhood club and the team that his whole family supports. So there you go. Uh, and worst of all, Nick Zainiv and AFC Wimbledon, they just got relegated. First time in the club's history that they've been relegated since being formed in 2002. Uh, but frankly, you kind of deserve to go down. This is League One, by the way, where they were playing. So the third tier in England. Frankly, you kind of deserve to be relegated when you go 27 games in a row without a win. That is the longest streak without a win in the top four flights of English football uh, within a single season. So not crossing over two different seasons. Within one season, since Derby County went 32 in a row without a win in the 2007-08 Premier League season. Um, Funnily, the Dons weren't quite as awful. If you look at the stats, weren't quite as bad as that suggests. Like, they weren't getting thrashed a lot. There were a lot of games where, like, um, well, frankly, to sum it up for them, they just had no clutch. Like, they blew more leads than ever any other team in League One this season. So uh, there you go. But I, I think I'm going to backtrack on that first thing. I'm not going to call these curses, though. I think if you look through the, the four different situations, you can find various reasons for these winless and losing streaks. Um, all unique scenarios in, in each instance um and i did go into some more detail on some of the specifics in the substack email this here is just laying out the stats um so what i'm going to call this rather than a curse is a i'm going to call it a cleanse i'm going to say that these are these guys just you know get in the get the bad juju out of the way 
before the All Whites play Costa Rica in a couple of months, uh, clearing the path for World Cup qualification. You know, whenever you do these sort of like um, you know, psychic rituals, you gotta you gotta give something in order to get something right. So here's some sacrifice in club form in order to maximize country form. At least that is my um, at least that's my explanation. I'm gonna stick to it. Bit of a fast, bit of a sauna, bit of a yeah. burning the sage, you know, good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, it, it worked for Kyrie Irving, so. <laughs> Not yet. I'm, I am curious, maybe. It, it got I, him a promotion. I'd like to see, GM. you know, what, what Sean Marks is doing to break some of that mm. voodoo as well. That would be interesting. Um, that would my be. stat here, Wildcard, is just updating Will Young on the Kiwi County Tour. He has played two games so far, three innings batting, 192 runs at an average of 64, three innings batting, two 50-plus scores. So two-thirds of his innings, he's scored a 50. Shout out Will Young. This comes after last winter where Will Young had nine innings, 368 runs at an average of 40, two centuries, 150. So basically, I'm not too fussed about the century marker. Um, it is cool to say, like, last year, Will Young scored back-to-back -back centuries for Dunham. Fucking fantastic. Not so worried about that this year. I'm more interested in the 300 run marker and his average. Because then he's gone two county stints where he scored 300 runs. And if he does, if he scores 300 runs in this stint, he'll be averaging over 40 again. And then it's back-to-back multiple years of county championship dominance from will young we did explore that a lot more in the patreon podcast we do want to throw out this thursday overnight it's will young versus colin de grand home fucking build a fizz up for that one let's get deep into the mangroves here wild card what have you found well, I didn't have to dig too deep in the mangroves to find that the uh, the Kiwi NBL season has started. Just as the um, just as the Aussie one gets into the semi-finals, which uh, bummer of a result overnight with Shaley's Melbourne United getting knocked out. I was hoping Illy would be able to go back to back with titles there, just as Will Young once went back to back with County Hundreds. That didn't happen. However, the the NZ NBL is here to. Um, to brighten everyone's upcoming few months. And I've just highlighted five players who, um, like no necessary rhyme or reason here, but just five players who I, I found nice and curious looking at the team lists and guys who I'll be keeping a close eye on just to highlight some people, give, um, give the listeners a bit of an in. So Dan Fotu is the first one, brother of Isaac, brother of Ella. Um, strong basketball and family, that one. So coming off a, a pretty useful senior season with St. Mary's College in California, he's just graduated from university there. He's a um, wing player, pretty excellent start to that last season where he was just slamming away points throughout. That did dry up a little bit as the season went along and other options emerged and um, didn't get quite as many uh, minutes and points and shots attempts as he, as he had been into the you know first month or so of the college stuff, but still pre did pretty well, played every game, all of them off the bench, curiously. He'd been a starter for his previous two years. Um, but yeah, 22 years old now, graduated. He's playing with the Auckland Tour Tata, so I'm pretty excited to see where he's at. Uh, Max Darling is number two. Been a curious few years for Max. He, he always delivers for the Canterbury Rams, but um, he's had some sort of strange situations in his professional pathways. He went to Croatia to play pro rather than going to college in the USA. A um, couple years there, not really playing a lot, but, you know, being around a professional environment and learning, developing, etc. But then the pandemic struck, so he came back um, home, signed a longish term deal as a development player with the Illawarra Hawks but didn't really get very many opportunities to play there and was released after one year. So here he is now. He is 21 years old, point to prove, um, getting ready to dominate some Canterbury Rams basketball, as he often does. Number three, Trey Morning, um, an import player, son of NBA Hall of Famer Alonzo Morning. Uh, that alone is interesting enough. But then also you look at like his career. He's 25 years old. He's had a couple seasons at the G League under his belt already. He went undrafted in 2019, I think it was. Um, did have a short-term deal with the Houston Rockets, but didn't actually play for them. So he hasn't played NBA yet, but he's been close. He was absolutely brilliant for Nelson in, the, in week one. They, they smoked Otago by about 20-odd points. Um, Trey Morning had 34 points, 14 rebounds, 4 assists in 30 minutes. Like, he was superb. Um, I would say a, an early MVP favorite, that fella. Uh, number four, Anzac Rosetto, playing for Franklin. 
So I picked him on the basis of watching him play, I think it was on Sunday, um, where he scored 20 points and 11 rebounds, shooting 9 of 10 from the field and a close win over an understrength uh, Hawks Bay team. I think when Hawks Bay get a few more of their Aussie NBL players, that looks like probably the strongest roster out. But um, Franklin pipped them in, in week one and Anzac Rosetta was a big part of it. He's 20 years old. He's a big fella, I think 6'10", um, something like that. Played for Nelson last season and could well be primed for a pretty big breakout based on that first game. He is a Otahu native, although I think he went to um, he went to high school in Nelson. I think he moved there with his family at some point. Spent two years at university in the States playing for the University of Charlotte. They've won basketball. And coincidentally, fun fact, the nephew of Ricky Ellison, one of the very few Kiwis to ever play NFL and is actually a Super Bowl winner. Um, and then number five, Braden Inger for Southland. So it was a little bit of a surprise when he was scooped up by the Cairns Taipans on a DP deal for the latest uh, Aussie NBL season. But this was coming after a pretty excellent season for the um, the Southland Sharks last year, where he averaged 14 and five. Um, ended up appearing in 15 games for the for the Taipans, uh, all like sort of minor minutes late in games. But that was the advantage of playing for a bad team, as you get a lot of garbage time. And he, he was able to develop his game a bit with that. Um, so now he's back with the Southland Sharks after a year in the pros, 22 years old, six foot eight, forward with a lovely job shot, hits three pointers. Um, this is like for him, this is the season after the breakout season and the NZ levels. So uh, pretty funky one to see, like, is he able to consolidate that? Will there be a drop off in production? Does he take it to a whole new level, which is what I'm hoping to see. And that's what we will find out with basically all these dudes in one way or, live, one way or another. So um there you go. Like, uh, who are we? Dan Fortu, Max Starling, Trey Morning, Enzo Rosetta, and Brandon Inger are five guys I've, I've singled out here for them. I wish I could highlight five Aotearoa Wahine on the LPGA tour, but there's only one. And to Pretty be good, honest, though. to be honest here, Wildcard, there's only one Aotearoa golfer of note. She's not on the seniors tour. She's not on some random tour in fucking Holland. Lydia Ko is on the LPGA tour. And she does pretty well on the LPGA tour. Fresh off a tied third um, at the latest tournament, the Palos Verde Championship. And Lydia Ko's trucking along quite nicely this year. Not astronomically bonkers good. But really solid. Seven tournaments played, three top 10 finishes, seven tournaments played, five top 20 finishes, and her worst results are tied for 25th, tied for 23rd, and if you're worried about counting someone else's money, tied for 25th, pocket, pocketed Lydia Co 40 Gs, tied for 23rd, she made 17 grand. So you do all right when you're uh, making the cut on the PGA Tour or the LPGA Tour. And not only has Lydia Ko made the cut in every single tournament she's played on the LPGA Tour, top 30 for every single tournament, top 20 in five tournaments, top 10 in three tournaments, all of which is pretty impressive considering Lydia Ko hasn't been very good uh, off the tee or with her first few shots. Now, this is a trend that I've explored. I think last year was the big year I explored that idea. Um, and it's continued. Like Lydia Ko, not the biggest driver, not the most accurate driver. And even if she's hitting her irons off the tee, she isn't the most accurate, longest hitters on the tour. So, for example, driving distance, she's 78th. Driving accuracy, she is 153rd. What does Lydia Ko do well? Anything of fucking around the hole. Putting average, first. Sand saves, second. Putts per greens and regulation, eighth. The issue for Lydia Ko is that she is 66th in greens and regulation, which goes back to hitting off the tee. So Lydia Ko is still one of the best players on the LPGA Tour right now, primarily based off her short game. And if she can find some form with the longer stuff, her irons and her driver, she is going to be a dominant force. Um, but that's kind of like hoping. 
we're dealing with what Lydia Ko has actually done, and she has been a dominant force with her short game, which is good enough to see her consistently finish, you know, top 10, top 20. So there is room for improvement there for Lydia Ko. Otherwise, it's been a really solid start to the year. She won a tournament. She's got a tied for third. And she's doing all right. She's doing all right. She had COVID. They went to Asia. A bit of a hectic period. Whereas now, Lydia Ko, next few tournaments, New Jersey, Las Vegas, North Carolina, New Jersey, Miami. So strictly in the US of A. And Lydia Ko is going to keep on trucking. Question time here, Wildcard. I am fairly confident in my ability to smell out a stinky sports team. The big, uh, not win, but a big thing that reinforced this for me was spotting the White Ferns stinky vibe, not the players being shit, but everything around them being stacked on top of each other, bad moves, poor decisions, bad juju, then it, that is manifested in a pretty poor World Cup campaign. Slide into the NRL. One of my favorite sayings here, Wildcard, is there's always a worse team than the Warriors. There's always a team that is playing worse than the Warriors, and there's always NRL an NRL team who has more dramas than the Warriors. Which brings us to the Canberra Raiders and Newcastle Knights who are just stinky. Everything about them stinks. Their footy stinks. Their dramas stink. Their culture stinks. The whole thing stinks. Do you have any stinky teams right now, Wildcard? Like, not historical teams that pop up like, oh, that was a stinky team. No, just in your world of sport right now, are there any stinky teams that you can sniff out from a mile away? There's definitely a couple. Um... I won't get into some of those flying Kiwis guys I mentioned earlier. A couple of them have some uh, a little bit of stinkiness. Not not complete. It's more down to well, like AFC Wimbledon was definitely a stinky team. Um, but I mean, there was a bit of that in the NRL rounds with the Dragons to start the season. Um, might be coming out of that now. Uh, halfbacks in some great form leading the team. A couple of, like, Francis Mollo has been really good for them. Um, a couple of nice signings like that. And I still don't necessarily love the direction they're heading in, but they're at least being a better version of that. So the, I, I think they've got off some of the stink. I think they've had a shower and, um, and sort of some of that out. So there's that. Um, definitely, if I'm saying teams I support, Manchester United would be on that list. And uh, one thing I've learned very, very swiftly um, over the last couple of years is just like, when Manchester United have a bad result, just don't listen to the podcast. Don't read the articles because it's the same stuff over and over. People acting like another game of the exact same evidence is somehow making everything worse. It's like, you've got an interim manager for six months going nowhere, can't make any signings because you're waiting for the next manager to do that. Like, what do you expect? You think this team's going to get better in that time? They're in a holding pattern. So just, just like, don't just tune out. Like, I even watched them this morning and they, they, they won 3-0 and they're getting critiqued to hell and the pundits afterwards. I'm like, this is, this is a waste of my time. I could do much more productive I, I, things. I, I, I'm this. sorry. I didn't mean to trigger you. Like, I didn't mean to trigger you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, this, this is what I'm saying. The lesson is just tune out. Like, acknowledge the situation they're in. Don't worry about it. Like, the, the things will get better in the summer. Now is not the time for the team to make drastic changes. So it's just kind of, a, kind of an awkward holding pattern for them. But definitely, in terms of teams that I cover, the... Uh, the Aotearoa Breakers would be high on that list. I think it's I think it's safe to say when you've had like four straight years since the new owners came in, ownership change, um, inherited a team that was literally in the semifinals that year, had won championships in like four of the previous six years or something before that, hasn't made the playoffs since, continually make bad roster decisions every season they're coming in and it's like, this, is, this team's good enough. Look at the talent on this team. It's good enough to win a title and then they can't play together. Um, relying on a coach to be able to put things together. And he has so far shown no ability to do that. Um, uh, deciding that it's a good idea to just keep picking overseas youngsters and giving them heaps of minutes and they cause to feel like some of the, the media you know, stuff. We know the there's a lot. We know the stink. There's, a, there's a lot where we could go. There's plenty of stink in the, in the breakers. So I would say the breakers are leading that, um, leading those rounds. I, I'll throw back a question for you now. Um, 
just nice and simple. Um, not even a question. Just tell me something interesting from the Kiwi NRL realms that I might not be aware of or that the listener might not be aware of. One thing I have noticed, uh, just checking some stats and rolling through the NRL player profiles, is, and of course, everything's framed by the World Cup. So, like, obviously, if you support Samoa, if you support Tonga, like, everything's framed by the World Cup. Kiwi's footy is framed by the World Cup. Hence, when I, whenever I mention, like, someone like Dejan Asi, fantastic opportunity for him to get into the Samoa World Cup squad. So maybe that's a low-key answer there, Wildcard, is the World Cup is here. So yeah. keep that in the back of your mind when you're watching NRL footy. But I have noticed that Nelson Asofasola Mona and Joseph Tarpani are both they both have the highest meters per game of their careers. And that is pretty exceptional considering they have been among the best middle forwards from Aotearoa for at least five years. And at the same time, James Fisher-Harris, has, he, his meters per game has gone down, but it's still higher than Asafa Solomona and Tapane, which just excites me for Aotearoa Kiwi's footy because I want to see an Aotearoa Kiwi's team with the Sofa Solomona, Joseph Tarpane, who was fantastic against the Raiders. A Sofa Solomona was, you know, dominant against the Knights. And we can't forget his uh, kick against the Warriors as well, which changed the game. Like game-changing kick, try assist for Nelson A Sofa Solomona. Chuck them in with Fisher Harris. Oh my God. God, which had, that has coincided with Jesse Bromwich and Jared Waidea Hargraves. Their stats are going down, which is understandable. They're veterans, but if you package that all together as a forward pair, so to boil it down further, I'd just say keep a close eye on Asafa Solomona, Joseph Tarpin, and James Fisher Harris. They are absolutely beastly middle forwards in the NRL. Um, how Tarpane gets out of that stinky Raiders bit is going to be interesting. Otherwise, Asafa Solomona, Melbourne Storm, best team in the NRL, second best team in the NRL, Fisher Harris, Penrith Panthers, best team in the NRL. So high caliber, um, strong pedigree there, preparing for Aotearoa Kiwi's World Cup campaign. Midgia Test as well. Musical jam here, Wildcard. I just want to big up um, this dude, Noah Slee two E's. He's from Aotearoa, moved to Berlin, apparently, and he's just got some soulful, funky jams. So check him out. Noah, N-O-A-H-S-L-E-E. -E. Noah Slee. And we've got a new album from Action Bronson, um, Cockadrillo Turbo, which, if you love Action Bronson, it's just more of the same. More of the same, like, uh, imaginative bars funky production and an enjoyable listen i don't think it's anything groundbreaking or or extravagantly new from action bronson but if you do like action bronson new album and if you've never heard of action bronson rapping before tune in musical jam for you walker musical jams for me i would um on the local scene, I would highlight a band called Best Bets um, from Rangi Order. They are a just sort of, you know, um, power pop, pop rock type of, you know, sunny guitars and, and good hooks, short, sharp songs. Um, they've got a new album that just came out last week, I think it was. That one's very good, enjoying that. Um, and then also from a, from a wider international perspective, Fontaine's DC, Irish, um, Irish rock band, they've their new ones out that's awesome um been listening to that new father john misty album that i sort of took a couple of weeks to get around to different sounding um to what he's done in the past i'll sort of explore that a little bit more in the album jukebox this month but um a couple of songs in there are real bang well, bangers is the wrong word because it's very slow and sort of dirgy and more of a storytelling album than a um than a energy than anything with any like energy or as usual like um satire or heavy personality influence kind of thing um and then going even more obscure it's an album by a uh, artist from i think san antonio in, in texas called claire rousey who is like an ambient um artist and it's 
very like um the only thing i've really it's not a, a genre of music i've really touched on much in the past um other than a little bit of like william basinski so it was, there's a bit of crossover there that type of thing like sort of um field recordings mixed with like sparse violin and piano it's it's definitely like the kind of thing you'd um you could like stick on in the background while you're doing something else and but then also it, it's even though it's quite like sparse and um and very very subtle it's also like if you just sit there listening to it it's quite like moving it's kind of a weird experience listening to it there's not even a lot going on but then also it just feels like very real in a in a funky way i guess because there's a lot of like just generic everyday kind of sound footsteps or stuff where you don't even know what it could be like i don't know if this is just someone eating breakfast or something like a plate on the table or, i don't know like it's there's just like subtle noises it's it's a strange one it's a different thing to what i've sort of um spent much time with before that's uh claire rousey i, I can't remember i can't remember what the album's called everything something something already here everything that's perfect is already here i think it's called um so that was definitely an experience that i hadn't had before and i just thought i'd shout that one out too shout out the mellow bangers yeah there you go the mellow bangers the mellow bangers Kia kaha stay beautiful back with another big old niche cast on thursday read all about aotearoa sport the niche dash case.com Kia kaha stay beautiful church -er.